Let's get the analysis joined by Dr. Mohamed Munir, virologist from the University of Lancaster up in the northwest of England, a place I know extremely well. Uh, Dr. Munir, uh, always a pleasure to have you on our programme. The EU has approved then this Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, in your opinion, how big a development is this? Well, Mark, thank you very much for having me. I think the major challenge uh, EU has been facing so far is the supply of the vaccine. So any vaccine that is efficacious, more than 60%, is certainly a good addition into the uh, existing portfolio of the vaccine. And um, as, as the report indicated, I think the advantage that I can see from the scientific perspective is that this is one of the very few vaccines those being tested by the time new variants were emerging. So, for example, this vaccine have over 50% efficacy against South African variant. So this is is one of those a few solutions that could be offered to countries like South Africa, where AstraZeneca did really completely fail. So certainly this vaccine has advantages, not just the supply, but also the nature of the vaccine. So it's easy to store, perhaps easy to supply in, in, because of that. Uh, this 66% um, effectiveness for you then, that isn't a problem. No, I don't really think it is a problem because um, its efficacy against the severe form of the disease is really high. Um, but advantage is that it's a single dose. And uh, although it's a single dose by trial, but if you compare the single dose efficacy compared to other uh, vaccine, it isn't really any different. For example, if we talk about AstraZeneca, the overall vaccine efficacy is around 66-67% with the double doses. So with this one, I think it's matching with the single dose um, overall competition among other vaccines. That sounds promising. Um, it's just over a year since you and I first spoke on this program and you, you warned us about what was the worrying COVID-19 problem becoming a pandemic. And I, I, I think you're actually the first person to actually say that on air uh, anywhere. Um, so being the first to have predicted it, do you see now an end in sight? I'm not, I'm not asking you to get out a crystal ball, but do you think we're now in, in the beginning of the end? Is there some light at the end of that long tunnel? Well, thank you much for remembering, Mark, for remembering that uh, uh, statement. Uh, I wish I would have been wrong. But I think what we have seen so far is that immense progress with the vaccine development and overall strategies for the um, control of this infection with the testing and tracing and also the, for the therapeutics development. Well, certainly we have the light at the end of the tunnel, but certainly other aspect of this uh, whole scenario is that we still have so much to do. And I think for me at this moment, the most important thing is that we can vaccinate the world in a relatively shorter time. That is the only benefit we, we, we have to do because without having a full vaccination in a relatively shorter time, meaning that we are allowing this virus to evolve and if it can carry on evolving, that's going to pose a challenge that we probably wouldn't have the solution for. Doc, Dr. Munir, you mentioned test and trace. I'm not going to ask you about that. That's opening a whole new Pandora's box. I'm coming back to the actual supply of the virus and the availability of the virus. Um, I know the United States is now in the process of, of stockpiling to uh, immunise uh, America first. Uh, that's uh, kind of a, a Donald Trump phrase which Joe Biden's buried borrowed for this particular issue. Um, and this behaviour has been kind of copied across the rich nations. Is there more than ever now, do you think, a danger that vaccines are becoming almost geopolitical tools? Um, I think it is, and it's probably the biggest enemy than the COVID-19 itself, because we do know that this is a transplant reinfection, does not really respect the borders. And uh, whenever any infections come into uh, society, like, for example, putting into the perspective, the Kent variant that was first isolated in the UK uh, back in October, um, now uh, around 65% of infections in France belonging to this new variant. So this is really the nature of the disease. And we should not expect that we are living in an island in a small country. No, until the whole world is not vaccinated, we should not claim any victory. And having a, a vaccine nationalism is really a big danger. And at the moment, as you know, the, most of the developing countries have already started vaccinating. And here in the UK, we are certainly the third largest country have the vaccine. Still more than 100 countries in the world are the one that have not yet received even a single dose. So we can't really claim the victory against this infection until the, 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 the infection is cleared from the rest of the world. If, if you don't mind, I'll ask you your opinion about the, the AstraZeneca vaccine, which um, certain states uh, within Europe uh, have decided to stop using, uh, Denmark, uh, Norway, um, basically deciding after cases of uh, patients who've had the vaccination having blood clots, thrombosis afterwards. Uh, the European Medical Agency is saying, well, basically, there's no proof 
and the, the benefits outweigh the possible risks. I just wonder where you stand on the AstraZeneca issue. Yes, absolutely. You can certainly ask that. I mean, at the moment, we have 30 cases of the blood clot out of the 5 million doses that have been administered in the EU, which mean one in 166,000 people. That isn't really any different than the regular blood clotting that could be observed in healthy people. So for me, as it stands now, relatively seems weak link, but that is actually the, the biological procedure that we already have in place, that whenever there is any concern, the rollout of or the trials are paused, independent committees sit on and analyze it before those are resumed. So certainly something that needs to be watched in, in coming days. Dr. Mohamed Munia, as ever, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Virologist from the University of Lancaster up in the northwest of England. Thank you, sir. Pleasure to, pleasure to speak to you.